Welcome to Radical Books and Politics. I'm so excited to have Matt Zedillo and as our first official guest. Matt, it's a fucking, oh, I can say fucking, it's my channel. It's an honor, man. And um, I've been a longtime fan and I've been watching your YouTube videos over and over again. And I think, you know, you're just amazing. I'm gonna gush, I can gush. So, but I don't know, where are you from, Matt? I don't know a whole lot about your background. Well, I mean, um, I'm from Los Angeles, you know, but I'm, when speaking to an international audience, I'm from Los Angeles. When speaking to a um, national audience, uh, I'm from uh, East Los Angeles. When speaking to an audience from Los Angeles, I'm from El Sereno, right? So El Sereno. Like, all these distinctions, uh, I mean, get made. I mean, I, I don't live anymore, but like, you know, that's where I was born. Um, I've been all, I've been all divided, there. like it's like really identity based, like this here in Chicago, like I'm from the South side and I take more pride in that. You got your people that are from the North side that you know are kind of bougie. And you got your people from Humble Park, you know what I'm saying? So does it have right, right. kind of identity? Yeah, kind of. Because, well, like, I mean, like, if I, t if, I if, for, if I go to Chicago and I say I'm from El Sereno, no one knows what that means. Um, so it's basically just to say I'm from East LA, right? So that'd be yeah. like, they don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, but if you're like in uh, LA and you say I'm from East LA, they're going to think you're from East LA, <laughs> which is different than El Sereno. Oh, um, I see. So, okay, so does the east side of, of LA is made up of, I mean, essentially five five different little cities. So there's, there's East LA, Boyle Heights, Lincoln Heights, City Terrace, and El Sereno. Um, that's kind of where, but if you ask somebody from Boyle Heights, they're going to tell you the East side is only Boyle Heights and East LA. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you ask somebody yeah. from um, um, East LA, they're going to say the East side is only East LA. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought here too, and so they, they like keep trying to restructure neighborhoods, and I'm like, fuck you, dude, that's not North Side, you know, or right here. <laughs> between these two Irish communities. I live in Canaryville, and mm -hmm. Canaryville has this huge rivalry with Bridgeport, but most people know Bridgeport. But I'm gonna tell you what, Canaryville is awesome, dude. Working class Irish, like if you think of the show Shameless, it's not too far from that. <laughs> no, seriously, but it's very diverse and same thing, right? And they're always competing with each other in softball leagues, and it becomes like death battles, you know? It's pretty awesome to watch, though. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Can you hear the background noise or? It's life. Oh, good. So um, I, I always am curious about like people's writing journeys. What was that like for you? Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to be a writer when I was, a, um, you know, it's hard to say because I, I, I started off in life. I think, you know, I knew I had to get a job when I grew up. And so like knowing how to get a job when I grew up, my first ambition was to become, um, you know, have the best job there was. So I wanted to be I wanted a lot of power. So I wanted to be the president. But then um, oh, the United when, States. Uh, well, what I, yeah, I want to be a president when I was when I was uh, when I was like five. <laughs> and then I was told by my dad that I couldn't be president because we're Mexican, right? And I don't understand uh, what I meant. Uh, I thought he meant that I was born in Mexico. I was like, no, 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 dad. I was born in the, the hospital across the street. Um, but, but, but you know, so that was kind of pretty devastating here at seven. Um, and I don't want to make it sound like my father was discouraging because he actually told me I could be a congressman or something like that. So <laughs> you can still be a politician, but not just top dogs. That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 No, no, I'm, I don't want, I don't, so I'm not trying to play better, but like, that was pretty devastating. And he actually took me to Washington DC and I got to meet our congressman and stuff like that. So, cause he was in letters and stuff. So that was pretty cool um, of him to do, but that was a pretty devastating thing. Kind of, it, it took a while to really linger what that meant. So then I, I kind of gave away the dreams of being a politician and wanted to be um, a writer, right? And so then, like around 14, I started working on a novel. Um, worked on that to about 19, but then I had to get a job and start working. And then, you know, because the winds, the tides, the economy, I became homeless, right? And so I was like 20. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, about 23, 24. And um, around that time, I was like, well, you know, I've been told my whole life how smart I am, and yet here I am homeless. It doesn't make any sense. So, like, um, I'm going to go to the library and I'm going to read uh, Das Capital. <laughs> <laughs> that was my idea. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn about this working class struggle. And, um, and so like, you know, um, at the time I was drinking really heavily. I was really, really severe right. alcoholic. And, um, uh, and so kind of like was in this position where I had to kind of like choose my whole life was defined by, by my alcoholism and by, you know, my, my interest in, in knowledge, a kind of a library card in a bottle. So that was, that's kind of a different journey. But Anyway, so then I go to the library, I learn about this, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to put away my dreams of being a bourgeois artist, and I'm going to become a very serious organizer, and I'm going to go into Lowe's, and I'm going to, like, organize my fellow workers. And I read in some stupid book that what you have to do is you have to work harder than everybody and prove what a diligent worker you are, and then you'll gain your fellow workers' respect, and then you can organize them. 
what ended up happening was I ended up working harder than everybody and um and everyone hated me because mm. like I was kissing the boss's ass yep. and I was whatever and I got started getting hey, groomed for that was a bad idea brother it's yeah. a horrible idea that would never work right so anyways but like you know but I had this idea they may not like me but they're gonna respect me no they hated me <laughs> and anyway so, so then I come back home to LA because I'm tired of like couch surfing I'm tired of like living in my car I'm tired of uh it's just too difficult so I just come back to LA um because this is out in Dallas and and, and it, you know life was just got too hard and things got too bad as I come back to LA, um, I meet up with, you know, I get, start getting back in political circles. I meet this guy, Dave Romero, who's also a poet. And we go to, um, but I knew, but I knew him a little, he was doing more like organized stuff. Uh, he just graduated from USC where he tried to get the sweatshops, uh, started at USC and stopped using sweatshops for their paraphernalia. So he was, you know, involved with political stuff. And we went to a May Day rally together. I was like, okay, cool, cool. And then um, he took me to this poetry reading. I saw people doing poetry and I saw like, a crowd of 100 people. And uh, I saw this guy doing this kind of political poetry, this guy Judah One. And I, and I saw what he did, how he like hooked around some information, had like kind of a talking point that he returned to. And I'm, I know how exactly I do that. In the same way that when you hear a radio, uh, a voice on the radio, you know, you know you can imitate it. I knew I could imitate that. Yeah. I knew I imitate that structure. And so I'm like, okay, I can do this. I'm going to come back here every week and I'm going to politicize this audience. They may not like me, but they're going to respect me, which was a <laughs> <laughs> attitude again. <laughs> well, imagine going to like a, a party, right? You're, like, you're not going to like me, but you're going to respect my robot. Like, look at that. <laughs> so that was my attitude uh, uh, towards everything. And so it didn't really happen that way. Instead, I made a lot of friends. Uh, I won some slams. Um, I got in the newspaper. I got in the LA Times. Nice. Um, I, um, I got published within like three months. No, uh, I, wait, wait, wait. Three months after you started writing, you got published? Damn. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, since then, I've, I've, you know, toured the country. Uh, I've spoken at the University of Cambridge. I've spoken at uh, Casa de Americas in Havana. Nice. Uh, I've uh, been on C-SPAN, opened for Left Forum. Um, yeah, that's amazing. You won a right? Yeah, I'm kind of famous now. So kind of, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, yeah, I feel cool. so blessed, Matt, that you came to Harold Washington twice, bro. And yeah, I think that they, they, to this day, when they did the um, the evaluations, that was a highlight of the course for them. None of the other awesome stuff I taught them, it was you coming to visit them and seeing um, somebody speak their truth, you know? And there were, there were we have quite a, a, a lively slam culture in Chicago. They loved you, dude, you know? So I, I want to thank you because I don't even think I paid you hardly anything at the time because, you know, the fuck out. <laughs> because, you know, it's limited budget. But you really made a difference. You really yeah. did, and and um even now I showed your um your how to write a fuck poem to my creative writing students. <laughs> they loved it. And in fact, that's actually a question I have. We we talked about appropriateness of cursing too. Like, what's the limit? Because my editor gets on my ass when I and I overdo it. You know, I curse like a hooker. I mean, I, I have the heart of a saint, but I curse like a hooker because that's how I am. You know, and I don't even think about it. it just fucking see, like it just comes out right. And yeah. um I I can be better about it. A lot of times I'll like edit shit out of my, my YouTube video. Um, but anyway, so it's not about me. But so I thought your explanation on that video was really um, awesome. But something else that you addressed, and, and it was kind of, I don't want to say it was explicit, but it was in there, is how do you balance the political with the art? Because my students and I have this conversation quite a bit, you know, and they, you know, they come to their own answers. Because on the one hand, I don't think you want to preach and proselytize, right? But on the other, you want it to be like an organic process. You know what I'm saying? So how do you negotiate it? Because I think you did it beautifully in that piece. Well, I mean, the, the, the question, I mean, the answer to that question is that you have to focus just as heavily on style as you do on substance. So people have this like this saying, all, uh, all style, no substance. And uh, of course, you want to have say something substantive. You want to say something important, but you want to say it well. Um, most people get involved in doing like political poetry. They sound like essays, and they're terrible. No, just, Jesus, no. They're, are, are, they're artistically, yeah, yeah, no. They're artistically terrible. So mm. like you have you have to like consider um you have to have you have to have multiple considerations. One, I'm going to show you something real quick. You have to have multiple considerations. One is a consideration you have to have is that you have to um you have to write well, and you also have to say something important. And if you can do those two things simultaneously, if you can say something important and write and, and say it well. You'll be one of the greatest writers to ever walk the face of the earth because that's all writing is. Um, interesting ideas expressed well. And so, like, uh, that's, you know, that, that's what it is here. Let me show you something quick. 
I'm gonna show you this other thing I really want to show you, but like, check this out. Yeah. Like, look, look I've lived my life in a way. Damn. That, that, that makes you, makes you paint beautiful. pictures and make sense. Who did that shit? That is beautiful. <laughs> um, that is an artist over at the, at the Dawson Center for the Arts where I'm the literary director. Um, so I conducted a workshop not too long ago, about, let's say two days ago, and I, I it was based around this thing. It's called oh, React cool. Poem, right? Oh, wow. So how, how, I, how I do my stuff. Yeah, that is beautiful. So on this side, you have your topic, your details, your point, right? So this is the political side. This is what my content, what I'm writing about. This is my substance, right? Over here is act one, act two, act three. That's my style, right? Over here is, is my, uh, my content. Over here is my content. Here's my form. Over here is my um, what, and over here is my how. Mm. What am I talking about? How am I saying it? And I treat those two things as separate considerations. You know what I'm saying? They're not the same thing, right? So what you need to do is you really need to focus on um, not, you have to focus on the information you're delivering. You have to do research, right? So that's how you get the, the, the that's how you get the political insights. The research that you're doing, you're putting into this thing you want to write about. So let's say you want to write about Chicago in the 1920s. Yeah. Don't just go with what you already know about Chicago in the 20s. Like do a research project, learn more information, grab bits of information. So those are your details, right? That is what the is first point? time, Matt, I've ever heard a poet say they researched the poetry. First time ever. Well, there's a reason why I've been to, to been invited to the University of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and so um, and so like uh, so you do all you do your research, so, and that's where you gather your details, and then you organize your details into Act One, Act Two, Act Three, right, to best serve your point. So you pick your topic, right? Right. You gather your details, right? You consider your point. Over here on this other side you organize your details to best service your point. How is the most dynamic way of expressing this to get my point across? What comes first, what comes second, what comes third, right? And so for the way I typically write, not everyone has to do this, but in act one, I'm world building. Act two, I'm giving yourself, I'm giving the audience a problem to solve. Act three, I resolve it. Now, right. resolution, when I say res resolution, I don't mean I solve the problem necessarily. Right, right. It could be, I, I, could, I just leave you lingering with this problem. That's also a possibility as well. So I can, I, can, I can end you with a call to action or I can end you with you like, isn't it sad? Isn't it horrible? And the thing about the way I write is, is, I, is I understand that art is contrast, right? So like if I'm just going to write like a sad personal poem, well, in order for it to be really, really sad, there has to be a ray of hope, right? Right, right. And so because that's what makes it sad. The, the good times are only good times because there were bad times. The bad times are only bad times because there was the possibility of good times, because there was hope, because there were good times, right? So let's say I wanted to write this a sad bastard poem, right? right? Okay, well then in act one, I would give you, I would build the world up where I'm sad. In act two, I would tell you how things could have been different. In act three, I'm gonna tell you why they will never be different, right? That's gonna make you cry. Yeah, 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 no, that's legitimate, that's beautiful. I've never seen it broken down like that, and I've been teaching poetry for a long time, but I think teaching poetry is very difficult. Like, I, fiction, no problem. You know, um, any any genre I can just about, except for romance and some that's not my cup of tea. But poetry is difficult and that is the most systematic process I've seen. And the other thing that I've noticed from your poetry is that um, it's very rhythmic, right? But you speed up with intention. And I, I mean, a lot of performance poets do that, but you, I think you even analyze that down to a political message. And I knew that even before I, like I said, I saw that video, um, I, I just think, you're right. You're pretty damn amazingly smart. I hate to keep gushing, but I, you can see that you work really hard in your pieces. So in print, though, I've never seen any of your poems in print. Isn't that crazy? I, I, I bought a chapbook. What? Um, so we're going to talk about that. When you do your parts, do you separate them into stanzas or is it one block poem, but you know where there's going to be the turn and where the parts are? Or do you? Yeah, so, sometimes in stanzas, usually it's, a, it's one block poem. Like this system here is for me to know, right? right? And so I want to move you. I want to move you seamlessly through this process. I don't want you to be aware of what's happening. Oh, happened. I see. I just want you to feel it. So, like you know, this is for me. This is like this is like the magician's layer, yeah. right? And so I, I I want to get things in a way where it's seamless, and you don't know it, but I know it, nice. right? So you're just like you're just, you're just like watching a movie. You're just like, oh, you're here. Now you're there. Now you're there. Now we're doing a scene change. You know what I'm saying? Like that's kind of the yeah. way I try to do things. That's awesome. And like, and here, and here's the thing, for me. You know, this is my advice to writers in general. You have to know why you're good. 
Like you have to know what, what, what about you is good, right? Like what about you is excellent? What about you is like, a, a, what, what do you do at a different level than other people do? And you hone that skill and oh, keep wow. honing that skill and keep doing that, right? Because, you know, what you really need to do is you develop a style. Right. You need to that's that style. what I was going to ask you. When did you know you developed your voice and style? Um, I don't know. Probably, probably like two, three years into doing it. I figured, okay, this is like, these are the tropes I like. This is the way I like to do it, right? Um, but then it, back then it was organic until I, until I figured out this process and I was able to really systematize it. Right. But what I was going to say is you need to develop a style and then you need to turn that style into a discipline. Uh. And turn that discipline into a standard of excellence that you hold yourself to every time. So you have to have an idea as to why you're excellent and you have to like achieve that goal and variations of that goal every time. This is not about you. This is not about how you feel. It's about this thing that exists outside of you that is your work, right? right? And you got to stop taking it so personally. You got to stop thinking it's about you. And, and no, you absolutely. Are, I teach that you are, you are way more than you're, you. Well, you as a person are way right. more than your work. Like you as an individual person are, are, are way more and way, uh, you're a bunch of other things more right, than your absolutely, work. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I agree 100%. Could you hold on a second? Sure. Little man, you're being too loud. Antonio. No, no second. You're too that loud. He's, uh, he's got computer rage, gaming rage. It's so annoying. I get that from you. No, you get your rage from me. Your gaming rage is all you, bro. Get out of here. You're being too loud. Now you appreciate you crinkling that shit over there. I know you want to get, get out. Be quiet. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now, you blew away the stuff that I needed. You go, I'm no, sorry. Go take it up with your dad. Go argue with him. Go make your case. <laughs> He's so dramatic. Se cortó el dedo con un papel. Oh my God! My finger! I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, I'm going to take you. I'm gonna send you to Abuelita and Abuelita out in the desert, man. I'll leave you there for a month. Then you come talk to me. Uh, I suffer plenty. Thank you, sir. So, um, damn, you know, and I think, I think when I was able to separate the subjectivity from the writing, that's my writing started to get better, you know. And I and I publish quite a bit too, but that's not my goal. My goal really is to improve my craft, you know. Um, and, uh, but I've never heard it broken down like that. I think that's brilliant. Cause in that sense, you're not competing against other people. You're really competing against yourself, you know? And, yeah. It's, but yeah. it's also though, in, in the process of doing that, you, you, um, you become the world's leading expert as to why you're great. Mm. And, and when, when you're the world's leading expert as to why you're great, then nobody can ever discredit you because yeah. you're not trying to do anything. What you're trying to accomplish, you understand better than them. Right, they, right. You're not trying to you're not trying to uh, complete this abstraction called poetry. Yeah, you're yeah, yeah. trying to write a quintessential poem that's based upon your standard of excellence. So I don't care who the other person is; they can't discredit you because they don't know you. Right. I mean, and it's like they don't know your work. They don't know your work as well as you do. Right. So there's nothing they can say. I don't care if it's Juan Felipe Herrera. There's, there's nothing they can. Edgar Allan Poe could come back from the day. It does not matter. Mm. It do, it does not matter. They aren't you, and so they are not the master of your standard of excellence. So no one can discredit you, and also no one can validate you, yeah, yeah, other yeah. than you, because you're that's, the leading expert. That's you know what happens what? when you. That's do. brilliant. And I will tell you what, as a woman of color, because the thing with mental stress, you're like I say, we invalidate ourselves and we put ourselves down and. Part of that's internalized racism. Part of that's a school system. Like when people hear that I have a PhD in English, but you're Mexican. Fuck you. Fuck you. You know, seriously. And yes, I think they have up. the same reaction when they hear I'm, you're a poet or you're published. First, they make fun of you because they think it's a worthless craft, right? Especially poets. But I think this is so important to teach people, people in general, that they have to learn how to value themselves. I think this is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard, Matt in terms of creative writing, you know, it's, it's fucking profound. You should write a book about it. You know, I, I really believe it. Um, and then this might be a much better world. Uh, so I was curious about the title. I'm, I'm eagerly, it's not going to get here to July 5th. And I normally don't interview people until, you know, after, I usually read their work first. And so I, I'm familiar with the work, but I haven't read the chapbook, so I'm sorry. So I was wondering if you could explain or talk about the title, M Mowing Leaves. Is that what the, where did that come from? Mowing leaves of grass. Right, that's what it was. Mowing leaves of grass. That's right, so, okay. So obviously it's a reference to Whitman. Uh, ah, leaves of grass. Oh. Yeah. So leaves of grass is the quintessential kind of uh, um, quintessential American poetry text. 
um, and uh, Walt Whitman is obviously kind of considered yeah, yeah, yeah. the quintessential American poets along with like Edgar Allan Poe, Emily Dickinson, and a few others. Um, but he's in that little pantheon, right? Yeah. Uh, well, what a lot of people might not know about, about Walt Whitman was that he was a raging racist. Um, he, he said, uh, and he was well, particularly a, a, a proponent of the Mexican-American War. He was really big on that. Oh, you know what? He was at Alto de Emerson. I remember this history now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So Emerson was against the Mexican-American War, but he was also a racist. Mm -hmm. um, um, the one that didn't do anything wrong is Thoreau. And Thoreau was actually really thorough. <laughs> in his uh, in his anti uh, racism and his uh, anti imperialism, and so Thoreau was good. I mean, so if you're looking for if people are look if people out there right now are looking for a white person to be like that guy was great, Thoreau <laughs> was great. Um, but um, Emerson, on the other hand, uh, was against the war. So uh, Wilt, Whit, but but he he was also deeply racist. Mm -hmm. So Whitman said uh, in, in proposal in in in, in you know in, in full throated uh, what do you call it uh, enthusiasm about this possibility said, what does miserable, inefficient Mexico do with the grand mission of people in the new world with the noble race? I mean, there's a couple mm -hmm. more words in there, but yep, 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 essentially what yeah, 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 I remember that. Uh, and he also said stuff about, like, you know, we should take it all the way to the Yucatan. Uh, yeah, the we, we, our, our patience with Mexicans have, has, 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 is, is over. Now it's time to strike them. Uh, he wrote a poem, I believe it's uh, in, in the 1850s, and he says, uh, California, I will teach you this robust American love. Mm. Um, and he's writing this at a period of time when Mexicans are being lynched. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where people are being killed, uh, where land is being seized. This is during the gold rush. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible period uh, for, for Mexicans, and particularly for people uh, that were known as Indians of Mexican descent, which mm -hmm. could really be anybody, right. and which really could have been anybody at that time, right? And so, like, that was kind of, um, um, you know, this designation the U.S. government uh, that was put in. This is the time of, like, the Greaser Act. This is the time of right. the, the, um, the, the um, foreign miners tax. This is the time of all these, all these, all these like, horrible laws um, that are being passed in California um, against, again, this group of population known as Indians of Mexican descent, which again, could have been anybody. Um, and that was, that was really um, a horrible, horrible time. I mean, this is a time of like, you know, like uh, Joaquin Nieta and uh, the legend of the Joaquins and, and all this kind of stuff yeah. where people are fighting back and, uh, and being killed though, and being having and their heads chopped off and, and, right. being quoted in and, and so this is what women is kind of a part of that history, an enthusiastic part of the history. So, you know, this is hundreds of years later, um, I get a chance to write a book. Um, we're looking at the changing demographics in this country. We're looking at the country uh, some describe as the Browning of America. Right. So I'm thinking, well, what is a book appropriate for the Browning of America? Oh. Who, are the, who are the literary heroes appropriate for uh, the Browning of America? And I think Walt Whitman is inappropriate. I think, yeah. all, I think Walt Whitman is unfit to teach our children. And so Walt Whitman was very talented. Guess what? I'm very talented. You know, I don't think I don't think I'm any less talented than Walt Whitman, just to be honest. I mean, like, you're probably more talented because you missed. You, you, I bet you. Yeah, I probably am, and I'm not racist. So no, like, and so that, that's kind of subjective and arrogant and all that came along with you know. Hey, yeah, so yeah. You well, well, you know, a lot of people think I'm subjective and arrogant. That's fine, but I have I have this systematized thing here, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, like I have. Oh I have, no, Walt Whitman done got that shit. Hey. No. Um, so. Yeah. Can you, can you, um, you know what, you're brilliant at memory, I'm sorry, I keep gushing, look, I think it's incredible how you memorize your poems, mm -hmm. do you want to read us a bit from the book, or, or, or a sure. Poem? okay, sure, this is, a, this is a poem from, uh, and you're gonna do it from your memory, right, yeah, I'm gonna do it from memory, damn, damn, we gotta do another show, so you can teach my, just teach me how to do that, you know, all right, here we go, right, uh, see, some are born to summer homes in palatial groves or pain, was only to ever unfold from the pages of secret gardens the red front grows by. Not I. See, I come from the stock of star-eyed astronauts who greet the night sky with big dreams and wide eyes always running mm. down the devil's highway through occupied America. On the way back to us on Mango Street and all the books he didn't want us to read. Raised on a handball off the back wall of a panaderia born east the river post Mendez versus Westminster, one generation with the red lines and diplomas that were signed that those dreams in that skin need not apply. See, I come from struggle. And if my story offends you, it is only because you made the mistake of seeking your reflection in my self-portrait. See, this, well, this may not be about you. So some are born of the common core, whose reflected faces grace the pages of doctrines discovered in ages to be explored. World, world hardships crashed against new shores, New England, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, for others pushed off to the island. Aslan, do not call this brown skin immigrant. Child of the sun. 
son of the conquest, Mexicano blood, running through the veins east side of Los Angeles. Do not tell him it will native tongue and song will best be sung. Do not tell me who I am. Because hmm. I was raised like you. Miseducated in some of those very same schools off lessons and legends of honest Indians and Christian pilgrims and a nation of immigrants all united in freedom. That isn't until they pulled aside my white friend, pointed directly at me and said, Scott, I judge you by the company you keep and you spend your time with it. Hmm. The same old story, 1846. The adventures of Uncle Sam, the stick up man, a wet bat. Show me your papers now, give me your labor, the melting pot. It was never made for the hands of cleaning. The American dream has always come at the expense of those who tucked it in. You don't know that. So you don't teach it. Could write you a book, but you won't read it. So you know what? This is about you. In 1492, and the Treaty of Guadalupe, and California missions, and Arizona schools, these racists that try to race us as they raise their kids in cities that bear our names. But you can learn some today from Ferdinand to Minuteman, from Arpaio to Alamo, from Popo Budio, so Joaquin the Indian, and so lives in me from May 8, 1743. They try to bury us, they didn't know we were seeds. So we can have minds, Lino Strike, the Plan de Allah, Mizopada, Joaquin Mireta, that's our elite, that's Brown Beresi, Zapatistas, Mitch Nixon, the third Napoleon, from Peckinpah to Houston, from Lone Star Republic to Christopher Columbus, all the way down to Don. Donald fucking Trump, we didn't cross the borders. The borders crossed us. Who you calling immigrant, Pilgrim? Damn, that is awesome. It's beautiful. It's it's um, wow. There's a lot in there. And and I, I love how you ended gentle. You know, that's beautiful, Matt. That that was that was wonderful. Yeah, that that's amazing. I, I I'm I'm like always in awe at how fluid your everything any poem that i've seen on youtube and you he has a great youtube presence if you guys want to look him up um so i just wanted to talk about it where, where can people find you on on social media uh you know they can find me on facebook i'm on instagram too but like uh i'm kind of like uh, you know how old i am i'm facebook old like i i know how to use facebook effectively um hey you know what Matt, that's like, where I sell the most books. People with mock Facebook, but I got like 4,000 Twitter followers. They don't buy my fucking books. They don't. They don't. They don't. No, they don't. So I, I find that like, I think Instagram's a way, a good way to get like famous and no money. Um, but like Facebook is the way I know how to like book colleges. I know how to like, I know how to get paid thousands of dollars for my colleges using Facebook. So that's kind of like, that's how old I am. Um, Man, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm both too old and too young for Twitter. Like, um, like uh, I, I feel like Twitter is for um, social media influencers and for uh, radio hosts of NPR shows. And I'm too young <laughs> to do that, but I'm also too old to be an influencer. Yeah, and you know what? I, I've had that internal debate, and yeah. even, even with his YouTube channel, because I'm like, well, I want to review books and have political guests. And at one point, I was giving away books, and I was talking to a famous YouTuber, and he was like, don't do that, because they're just going to come for the free books. And I was like, hmm, okay, it's a bad idea. But I'm I'm in the same boat. I'm like not a millennial, I'm not thin, I'm not like Anglo looking, you know, like some of these other older white women that are super, hey, they, there's a lot of moms that do cleaning shows, but they look like Barbie dolls. And then they have like meltdowns in the middle of their cleaning process, it's bullshit. But I mean, the cleaning is fine, they do great videos, but some of these are like little drama queens on YouTube. And it's a particular kind of look, it's still very Anglo. You're basically looking like a hot milf, you know? And, um, but I don't it's see a whole lot of people our age, you know, I don't want to age us, but it's, it's difficult. And, and, um, but at the, I was like, fuck it, I'll do my YouTube channel. So that's why I'm real happy you're on. Cause uh, to me, you're, you're all, you're, you're just, I'm like, I couldn't have had a better first guest, you know, to talk about something important and not be like, Oh my gosh, I can't clean my living room anymore. Bullshit. Um, yeah, you, you should watch those sometimes to get a kick out of that. Any upcoming yeah. events or, or, um, things people should look out for? Any upcoming events or things that people should look out for? I am going to, uh, I, mean, I don't know, the world's online now, so I, I'm performing at some universities, but I'm pretty sure they're all closed events um, via Zoom. Um, I don't, what, what do I have coming up? Uh, I don't know, just buy my book. I mean, like, buy my book. You can go to either. Um, oh, you know. Yeah, so. Well, so I have a question real quick, because is, is it being sold through Amazon? It's being sold through Amazon, it's being sold in Barnes and Noble, it's being sold. Um, uh, at Walmart, <laughs> things sold. Uh, well, Walmart.com. I mean, it's being, it's being, oh. sold, being sold at uh, all kinds of places. So, like, all right, sweet. So it's just a massive deal mowing leaves of grass. Mowing leaves of grass, yeah. Nice. I bought it through the 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 press. So 
hopefully more of the money goes to the press that way and Amazon doesn't get its cut. Well, yeah. Matt, I cannot thank you enough. I hope you come back. I, I mean, this was awesome. This is just, uh, you have no idea how appreciative my eight reviewers are going to be and my students. And, you know, I'm really grateful. Um, I do think that what you're doing with your poetry is amazing and, and it's important right now. I think culture is so crucial to to revolutionary struggle, man. And that I think is amazing. I love I loved it. I loved it all. So thanks, Matt. Well, thank okay. you. I, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna hear my closer. I would say, do what you love. Read as read as many books from Matt as you can, and write on. Right. <laughs> hey, book lovers! Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.